Good morning. Let's go ahead and get started with Grand Rounds. Uh, this morning, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, one of our chief uh, surgery residents, Dr. Sale Bunyan. Uh, Dr. Bunyan uh, grew up in uh, Baghdad, uh, completed medical school there. Uh, as you all know, like Europe, it's a six-year program, no college. Um, he also reminded me that three of the years were during the war, so if you think you had it tough, uh, he probably had it a little tougher. Uh, he then came to the United States uh, and uh, did some uh, clinical work in Houston and then joined our residency here. And next year he's joining two of our former graduates uh, for practice in the Woodlands just north of Houston. Uh, please help me welcome Dr. Bunyan. Oh, by the way, he became a citizen too. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. I'll be uh, talking today about liver neoplasms benign and malignant. Uh, and I have no financial disclosures. Uh, studying the uh, liver actually uh, started a long, long time ago, uh, more than 4,000 years. The first uh, uh, studies about the liver started back in uh, uh, the time of the Babylonians, uh, 4,000 years ago. Uh, when uh, the Babylonians rec recognized the importance of this organ uh, from wars and from, they noticed actually that bleeding is profuse and actually death is imminent at that time. Uh, they were famous for multiple things, including you can see here the Code of Hammurabi, which is the first constitution on earth, multiple uh, um, uh, architectural monuments. But also here, this centerpiece that you see here, this is the first anatomical uh, display of the liver. It's a clay model, and uh, scholars think that it goes back to 4,000 years ago. And it, it looks pretty good in terms of, if you look at it, the liver nowadays, especially this thing here, this, this, most people think that it's the caudate lobe. And this is the gallbladder or the gallbladder fossa. So these are the first uh, uh, sketches of the liver, I would say, um, recognizing its importance. Uh, unfortunately, there were, at that time, there were not much of surgical interventions, just given the lack of resources. Um, as years pass by and surgery has developed more and more refined technique, people were fearing intervening on the liver. But then in the late of 19th century comes this um, surgeon from Germany, Carl Johann Langbuck, which uh, was famous for two things, actually. Uh, 1882, he performed the first, first open cholecystectomy at that time for a gallbladder calculus. Patient left the hospital after two months. And the, a few years later, he comes back in 1888 and performs the uh, first left hepatectomy. Now, it was not a formal hepatectomy by the means that we know these days, but it was a partial resection of the left lobe. Patient survived, but the pathology came back normal liver. So I don't know what he took, but it was normal liver. Um, as years came by afterwards, Tiffany reported uh, liver resection in the U.S. in 1890. And uh, after a year in Europe, Luke rep uh, reported a liver malignancy that was removed also in 1891. Uh, and then a few years later, Keene here in the United States reported 76 liver resections. They were most of them benign lesions, small lesions. Few of them were malignant. Um, given the morbidity and mortality of liver surgery, uh, surgeons always were trying to get more techniques to minimize blood loss, and, to, and uh, that's what Dr. Pringle, famous Pringle maneuver, he he uh, he uh, that you know he he uh, described. At the beginning, it was a failure because six people that he tried it, they died actually, and he had to go back and refine his technique, try it on animal models, and come back and produce it again. And at that time, it was successful, and it started taking over from there. But the, the real liver resection came back in, in 18, 1952 from a famous uh, French surgeon, Dr. Lortab Jacob, who did the left-right formal right hepatectomy by uh, a vascular isolation of the pedicle. And uh, from then, surgeons started to be more um, um, confident to intervene on the liver. Um, also, we cannot forget Dr. Claude Conad, who described the anatomical segments. He started work in 1950, and, and he, what he did actually, he injected uh, acid through the uh, major arteries and veins in the liver that dissolves the hepa hepatocytes, and he described the anatomical um, um, uh, liver uh, segments 
his work came to clinical practice after a few years, actually, and not until the 80s, when the introduction of the uh, imaging technique started to uh, develop, and then we can, you know, kind of localize the tumor into these segments, and uh, people started using his um, uh, anatomical description for formal liver resections. So what happened between the 80s and now was basically um, a take an increase in the technique of imaging that allowed a lot of the liver resections to be more possible and, and uh, uh, feasible these days. Um, starting with the f ultrasound, and the ultrasound also, you know, have a lot of uh, leaps of progression, but ma mainly it's used now for surveillance for hepatocellular carcinoma and with a lot of percutaneous interventions for the liver. And then the CT scan, the single phase versus the three phase. The three phase will delineate a lot of the anatomical um, um, association of the um, uh, liver tumors. And now probably it's the standard of practice that we've been using. Uh, also the MRI it's, has a little bit more high, higher sensitivity to uh, the liver lesions. And also it gives you the opportunity to do an MRCP to get even the intrahepatic lesions. And um, recently the PET scan which has been added to um, uh, look at extrahepatic extension and subtle hepatic lesions. So before starting to talking about the tumors, there's a, talk a little bit of evaluation of the hepatic reserve because this is a very important uh, step before uh, planning any hepatic resection. Probably the most important one is number four here, which is basically the CT volumetry, the standard of practice here in the United States about how to evaluate livers for resection. And uh, basically there's a manual and automated ways to calculate the livers, the weight of the liver, to, the remnant liver to the weight of the original liver and calculating the how much percentage you have left after the planned resection. And in normal livers, you need 30, more than 30% 30 to um, uh, survive the surgery and function normally, while in a cirrhotic liver, you will need more than 50%. The other ones on top, they are not much used anymore. I mentioned the only the first one just for upside purposes. We get asked that question sometimes, and they ask about the endocyanin green, the retention after 15 minutes. If it's less than 14%, that's a good function, and it's a, an indicator of acceptable outcomes after liver resection. While if it's more than 20%, then that's a contraindication for surgery. In between, you have to weigh it based on uh, multiple uh, other factors. And this is kind of a, um, a quick diagram, basically, just to uh, summarize what I mentioned right now. Now, talking about in this talk, I'll talk about the from the benign aspect of the hepatic neoplasm. But I'll talk about cystic and the solid. The three main ones are the hemangiomas, adenomas, and F, uh, FNH. And for the malignant neoplasms, I'll talk about hepatocell carcinomas, uh, intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas, and metastatic carcinomas to the liver. Starting with the cystic neoplasms. Um, with the increase of the use of the imaging, we've been seeing a lot of those uh, as an incidental finding because most of those are um, uh, asymptomatic. They are common. Um, we see them a lot in laparoscopic cholecystectomies. It's a small cyst that has a blue hue, like a bluish tinge color. It's really nothing that does not have any um, uh, significance. Sometimes they get really large, especially when they're associated with other um, as diseases like polycystic liver and polycystic kidney, they could re reach real large sizes, and at that time, if they become symptomatic, then you need to uh, merci resect them or mercipalize them laparoscopically or open. Uh, recent papers have been talking about biliary cyst adenomas. Those are less than 5% of the cystic neoplasms. Papers are, you know, really different about the incidence. Some of them said it's up down to 1% of cystic neoplasms. And those are a little bit different because they have the malignant degeneration potential. Uh, they have risk of recurrence, and they have a specific characteristic on the CT and MRI that they have a small papillary projection and septation and calcification and spots of hemorrhage within the cystic neoplasm. If that's suspected, then the management would be a surgical resection of that cyst, uh, given the malignant degeneration potential. They could develop into a cystic uh, and into a biliary cyst adenocarcinoma. This is an example of a patient that had a polycystic liver and large cysts that had to be mercipalized just given the fact that they were pressing on nearby organs. <coughs> Hemangiomas, those are the most common hepatic <coughs> lesions and they have a female predominance just like most of the benign uh, liver lesions. There is an increase association with oral contraceptive pills. The key, key um, phrase here that for residents to memorize for the MRI or CT appearance is peripheral nodular enhancement, and that was actually a question on the app side this year, um, describing how the, this looks like. Um, uh, hemangiomas are common, they are uh, rarely symptomatic, and um, based on, if they're asymptomatic and incidental finding, we don't need a biopsy because they can, we, 
with high sensitivity with CT scan, we can identify them. Um, the size really does not affect the management, although some people are saying that if it's more than 10 centimeters, then risk of bleeding is, is increasing, although these bleeding from those is really rare too. And you don't need any imaging to follow up for these. Uh, well, if it's symptomatic, then the main things are pain from stretching of the capsule, bleeding, as I mentioned, is rare, and there's a class, this Casabac Merritt syndrome, basically it's a consumptive coagulopathy with the, with the thrombocytopenia, and in these cases you need to uh, um, uh, intervene, whether it's um, inoculation versus uh, formal resection. Uh, if, if it's bleeding, then embolization, then resection. Um, people who are poor surgical candidate and have an indication for an intervention, there is, um, uh, you can do radiation versus embolization. And this is um, the, if you look from the left upper, then to the, there's peripheral enhancement here to the right upper, and more enhancement down here, and more enhancement in the right lower one. That's the classical, how it looks like for um, the hemangiomas. Adenomas, these are, um, um, the, um, the third common one, actually, and they have been classically, uh, the, the association with oral contraceptive pills have been described by Dr. Klatskin, who's famous for the Klatskin, described the Klatskin tumor, but he also, his liver workup has uh, led to the um, uh, discovery of the association with the oral contraceptive pill with adenomas. Uh, actually, if females who use oral contraceptive pills have a five-fold five increase of having it if used more than five years. It's also been associated with um, anabolic steroid use and, uh, and glycogen storage diseases. Uh, there is no biliary or portal involvement. These are just basically sheets of uh, hepatocytes fed by hepatic artery. And the classical presentation on a CT, in the MRI or the CT scan is in hyperintense on arterial phase and isointense on the portal phase. Um, and the classical question on the app side also for adenomas versus FNH is the sulfur colloid scan. There's no uptake here given the lack of cover cells. Now the Trad classical description of management of these given the risk of rupture and malignancy is to resect them, but more uh, discovery now happening for molecular genetics and we're able to identify subtypes of, hepa of hepatic adenomas. Um, the, three, the three main ones are the inflammatory, uh, and the, which is the most common. Uh, the second one is the one associated with hepatocyte nuclear factor 1 alpha. And the third one is beta-catenine. Uh, um, there are certain uh, uh, differences in, in imaging appearance, and they can distinguish between the three of them. But the inflammatory one is probably up to 40, 50 percent of those. And they are, those are the ones that uh, are more in females and have the tendency to bleed if they are more than five centimeters. Um, as the same, it's inflammatory, so there's an increase in the acute phase reactants and systemic um, um, inflammatory response with C-reactive protein and ESR if you look at the patient sy uh, systemically. The uh, hepatocyte nuclear factor 1 alpha is basically the least to, um, to bleed and the least to uh, have any malignant degeneration. Uh, from those. And the beta catenine is the third one. It's up to maybe 20% of these. Uh, those are the ones actually that has the malignant degeneration potential uh, um, more than the others. And uh, uh, that's why when, when it's, it's that type, then a resection would be uh, indicated. And I include it here. I don't know if it, you can read it there, but it's basically a quick workup. If you have a features of, of a hepatic adenoma, it depends if the patient is symptomatic or not. And if he's symptomatic from a bleeding, uh, or pain, then basically you have to intervene whether it's an embolization or resection, depending on how, um, um, how stable is the patient, if he's unstable. If he's stable, then you can also consider RFA sometimes. Um, if the patient is asymptomatic and you discover those, then in, me in, in male uh, gender, basically those are more aggressive in general, and then that's why you need to resect them. While in females, then, you can um, stop the oral contraceptive pill and look at the size, and if it's more than five centimeters, then that's when the increase in the um, bleeding and um, uh, malignant degeneration happen, you need to consider resection. While if it's less than five centimeters, then it depends on the subtype, the, the three subtypes that we spoke about. You can, for the um, um, uh, hepatocyte um, nuclear factor one alpha, you can watch and uh, you know and the inflammatory part too you can also watch them and follow them there's really no stand standard about how the timing of the follow-up but most people will repeat it in six months or a year the ct scans while for the um, canatine you basically need to um, consider resection bi biopsy or resection if um, if suspected uh, just given the fact that there's an increased malignant degeneration <laughs>
This is a, a classical presentation, hyperintense on the MRI. Uh, for FNH, there's really, um, it's the second most common, uh, more in females. There's association with other congenital malformations. Um, and it's um, on gross specimen, it's a firm light color from the inside and there's a lack of capsule. Um, it, uh, the classical presentation for the upside purposes is the bright arterial enhancement with a central scar. That's the main key here. Um, they have uh, no malignant uh, potential and they rarely, rarely rupture. Um, main symptoms are generally, generally if they grow in size, they will cause stretching of the capsule, so pain and fullness would be. And um, if it's symptomatic, then you need to intervene. If, if not, then or, or then you need to do anything. Sometimes you need to intervene just by the fact that you cannot differentiate between it for the lack of the um, classical imaging um, um, the, um, uh, criteria. And then you have you need to just to rule out to focus maybe an adenoma. Um, and that's the central scar here described. You can see how it's a hyperintense lesion with the central scar there. Now for the malignancy part, starting with the hepatocellular carcinoma, it is the most common solid tumor of the uh, liver. Risk factors um, in, in the United States is mainly hepatitis C. Worldwide is a hepatitis B. There's other, uh, I mentioned them over there, could be risk factors for um, hepatocellular carcinomas. The, uh, the American Association of Study of the Liver Disease recommends that for people who have cirrhosis, then there will be a, um, an ultrasound and an alpha fetoprotein screening uh, every six to 12 months. And if, if there's any abnormal ultrasound findings or elevation in the alpha fetoprotein, then you will consider the patient for a CT scan or MRI to try to detect it early. The, um, the classical presentation on imaging is an arterial enhancement with early washout of the contrast and the delayed cases. And uh, biopsy is, re is reserved if there's a doubt. And the left image here, you can see the enhancement early, and there's a washout in the late, delayed images. So once an hepatocellular carcinoma has been diagnosed, then therapy is a little bit complicated, just given multiple factors. How big is that tumor? And how much of an underlying liver disease we have? And what's the patient's performance status? And we have to weigh the side effects and complications balanced with an acceptable results for any intervention. The interventions could be anything, surgery, liver transplant, or local regional therapy, basically RFA, or the chemo embolization, those are the most two common, or chemotherapy, and I'll go through these now. So surgical resection, you try to, you try to resect those if possible. The, if a patient has a hepatocell carcinoma, um, a lesion that may be single with an underlying normal liver function, which is really rare because most of these happen in the, in the uh, scenario of a cirrhosis, then, but if it happens with an uh, acceptable liver function and almost normal, then you would resect those probably, that would be better. G even if, if, if the patient's underlying liver status is okay, those people have a higher mortality than the n resection for non-HCC, more than almost 4% more preoperative mortality. And then the outcomes after resection, basically it depends on how much disease we have and how much degree of vascular invasion the tumor had. Um, um, looked at multiple papers about five years survival after resection and, and it's variable. People say it's up to 37%, people say it's up to 57%. But the most consistent thing that I found is if the underlying liver is, is close to normal then and there's no vascular invasion, you can expect more than 50% um, uh, five year survival following, following these resections. The uh, second uh, surgical intervention for HCC is the liver transplant, and the classical Milan criteria would be the absence of macrovascular invasion, a single tumor less than five or three, uh, 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 less than three centimeters. There's an expanded criteria described by in San Francisco, but they go up to six and a half centimeters on primary lesion, and um, and the, for the single, the three single lead, they go up to four and a half centimeters. Um, but the Milan has been, I've seen more in the literature described. And the survival rate after transplant for this, if the patient meets this criteria, with the absence of systemic disease, like his heart, lungs are okay, then you would expect a high one year survival, more than 80%. Five year survival has been variable, but I've seen it up to more than 75%, between 60 and 75. Um, 
some people would, uh, centers have described not using the Milan and not the expanded, but they would use the RFA and, t and the trans arterial chemobilization to downsize the size of the tumor into the uh, margins of a surgical of the transplant. So, uh, and they described the two year survival goes up to 81%. <clears throat> If the patient is not a surgical candidate for a resection or a transplant, then there's multiple local regional therapies that can be used, and the RFA has been the most uh, famous one, given that it's, it has less recurrence and fewer treatment sessions. It is uh, uh, preferable for tumors that are less than four centimeters, because as the tumor grows up, then the RFA would be um, um, not if, as effective in killing all the cancer cells. And there has been good data to show that uh, for your survival for the people, the good candidates for this can reach up to more than 70 percent. Now there's a paper that talks about if the HCC is less than two centimeters, then uh, there's an equal, almost equal, uh, for your survival if you compare RFA, RFA with versus formal resection. Now, but as, as the tumor grows up, then a surgical resection will have a better five-year survival. There's a, um, not everybody is a candidate for an RFA because the patient is confused and jaundice or have portal vein occlusions, uh, large tumor burden outside the liver, or tumors at the hilar plate are very important because of the close proximity to the major biliary system, then if you do an RFA, you could end in a biliary leak. And those are very tough to, to, um, to deal with. That's why it could be, um, uh, it is a contraindication. There's multiple complications that could happen. Uh, there's the post embolization syndrome, it's like a flu-like illness. Um, there's bleeding, rupture, and you could see those tumors also sometimes up to 5%. And if an infection has been introduced, then a liver abscess could, lead, could happen. <clears throat> and this is basically, there's two ways, the percutaneous or the laparoscopic, but this is an example of the percutaneous when you localize it with an imaging guided. You introduce the needle and open those um, hooks and you burn multiple areas. And you have to include a rim of normal tissue with it to make sure that you got all the negative margin. The um, other mode of using is the transarterial chemoembolization. Um, the, the classical indication would be a child B patient who has a multinodular disease. Uh, and basically you go with an angiography selectively, um, select the arterial, the hepatic artery supplied to that tumor and, um, and embolize it with doxorubicin or cisplatin. Um, and it increased median survival um, a year and a half or two years. Uh, and also there's a contraindication. Portal vein thrombosis is a relative contraindication, but child C would be um, a contraindication to this. Last thing, if, if the patient is not um, a candidate for, get just given the fact that the disease has extended outside the liver, there, or maybe there's portal uh, um, nodes involvement, then uh, chemotherapy would be uh, the, uh, the solution. And what's described as a serofinib, uh, it's basically a multi-kinase inhibitor. And uh, according to the SHARP trial, it has increased survival uh, up to 11 months compared to the placebo, which was six and a half months. Um, and that's a quick breakdown to what we talked about, basically people who are surgical candidates who are the child A or early child B, uh, they fall within the resection or the liver transplant. And if the patient has a multinodular stage B, then you go to chemoembolization. And if it's an N1 or M1 lesion, then a chemotherapy um, or newer agent has been um, studied, but really nothing has been proven yet to be, um, um, it's still within the randomized control trial. And if the patient is basically decompensated liver function, then you have to treat them symptomatically. <clears throat> um, quick uh, talks about hepatic, intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. Um, this is the second most common uh, primary liver tumor. Um, it's basically uh, the same risk factors for uh, common bile duct um, uh, cancer, except that these are inside the liver, and mainly anything that leads to chronic liver inflammation, uh, mainly the uh, liver fluke, hepatolithiasis, um, um, uh, primary cyclorose and cholangitis, and hepatitis C. There's also some mixed histology with HCC, sometimes it happens here. And um, the reason that those people are, have more poor prognosis just by the fact that the presentation is usually late and there's always advanced stage and vascular invasion and sometimes even uh, mets outside the liver, um, which make them not a surgical candidates. Um, the classical presentation on a CT and MRI would be a hypo-intense lesion, and you don't have a primary GI source for that. Um, which end up, you end up having to biopsy those to confirm the diagnosis. Um, PET scan is also used sometimes. And for those cholangiocarcinomas, basically surgery is the main therapy if the patient is, uh, is a surgical candidate. Um, there has been description about chemotherapy, 
multiple agents, local, regional, with out of phase, but really those are, have no good outcomes. If the only thing that you could do if you catch them early is surgery, because that's if you catch them early with no intrahepatic metastasis, no lymph node involvement, and no vascular invasion, you could have a five-year survival between 25 to 40 percent. Other than that, the survival drops really low, and if there's a lymph node involvement, basically the survival is, is very demised there. This is a, uh, an MRI picture about um, our CT scan, I'm sorry, for the um, cholangiocarcinoma here in the liver, and you can see it could happen in the biliary system or inside the liver here. When we call uh, the last topic, it's metastatic hepatic malignancy. Those are the most common, um, and the liver is a major organ that has might, might have multiple metastases from multiple diseases. Uh, but um, I'm going to talk specifically about uh, uh, colorectal. Uh, uh, cancer metastasis, just the, given the fact that it's the most common one that we see in our practice. But when you talk about metastatectomies, the removal of a sur of, um, surgical removal of the METs in the liver, there are really two um, um, areas where it's going to be a gold standard. If the patient has an isolated METs with a good local regional control of the disease and good overall oncological factors, the example for that is colorectal disease, then you can, metastatectomy will be ideal in this situation. And the other option would be if there's no good systemic therapy for emets in the liver, like neuroendocrine, then basically you would, you would try to do a metastatectomy. The difference here is for colorectal, if you're trying to get an increased survival and cure the patient, while for the neuroendocrine, you're trying to achieve systemic, uh, um, I'm sorry, um, symptomatic relief. There's a very limited role in the um, pancreatic, gastric, lung, or breast cancer meds to the liver just by the fact that that means the disease has widespread and uh, um, the uh, risk is high. So for metastatic colorectal cancer, um, up to 50% of, of the colorectal cancer patients will develop liver meds at some point. And uh, nowadays, more and more patients are being eligible for surgical resection just given the fact that we're doing more screening, we're doing more surveillance, and we have better chemotherapy. So um, we're getting more people getting into the zone of liver resection after metastatic colorectal cancer. Um, diagnosis is basically the CT scan or the MRI. Um, if the patient has a known primary colorectal, you don't need a biopsy. But if there's no, you, the primary colorectal is, is, was not diagnosed, then a biopsy would be needed. Uh, an important point is, even with the liver meds, the CA level could be normal, and it's up to 20 to 40 percent in the literature that people will have normal CA levels. The PET scan is also of great use in determining not only the meds in the liver, but also the extrahepatic extension of a colorectal uh, disease. Uh, and most of these, and all these hepatic meds usually are supplied by a hepatic artery. That's an upside question. This is a PET scan of a patient that has a colorectal METS in the uh, right liver, and you can see some lightening in the portal lymph nodes, uh, bladder, and the pariortic lymph nodes. Um, this is a busy slide, but to make it easier in terms of the management of liver METS, if you have a, on the, this side here, if you have a synchronous metastasis, um, basically a colon and liver at the same time, would you resect them together or not? And if the patient has a solitary liver lesion and the uh, an underlying normal liver function with no comorbidities, and the resection of the liver will be nothing more than a, lo um, a lobect formal lobectomy, then you may proceed with the surgical resection combined. We've done those with, um, I had a case with when I was in the surgery C combined with transplant when they did reset the resection for the right uh, liver lobe and we resected the colon at the same time. But if the patient does not meet this criteria, then you may take care of the primary tumor and consider chemotherapy for the liver, and then restage it and see if it's resectable. For the metachronous uh, metastases, if, by other means, if the tumor, if the liver mets develop after you took care of the primary tumor, months or years, then it depends on what we call the Fong criteria, but described by the paper of Dr. Fong, or the what they call the assessment of clinical risk score. Uh, it depends on the nodal status of the primary tumor and the disease-free interval, whether it's a solitary or mu multiple liver mets, and the size and the CA level. The good, uh, uh, the favorable risk profile would be a patient who had a colon cancer before, and then when he developed his liver mets, those are solitary, with the interval has been more than 12 months, which makes it think that you know the tumor is indolent and not aggressive. The size is less than five centimeters and there is no extrahepatic involvement, and the CA level will be less than 200. 
then those probably will be, uh, you know, they will be fall into the category of you need to go and resect them, they will have better survival. But if they fall into the non-favorable uh, uh, risk profile, then you would consider them into a systemic chemotherapy and restage them at that time and see if they need additional chemo or palliative or maybe become candidates for liver resection later. Um, these are the um, survivals after um, a hepatic resection for metastatic colon cancer. And the third one, Fong et al., that's in, described in 1999. They had more than 1,000 patients. The 30 days mortality was almost 3%, but the five-year survival overall was 37%. It depends on those five criteria that we spoke about, and I'll show it in a second, uh, which are those here. Node positive primary tumor, disease-free interval less than 12 months, multiple liver mets, liver mets being larger than five centimeters and CA level greater than 200. You will take one for each of these and it goes scoring from zero to five. The survival five years after zero is 60%. It drops down to 14% if you have the all five of them. Another term that comes into play is the oligometastasis, which is basically you have a liver mets, but you have small mets um, whether in the liver or outside the liver. Like a patient who has maybe a left, right-sided liver meds, but he has also portal lymph nodes, uh, one or two of them. Would you consider those for a surgical resection? Would this be a contraindication for resection? And actually, most of those will fall into a pre-op chemotherapy area and then followed by a surgical resection or RFA to, to get the best results. Uh, but the pre-op chemo area will, will help us monitor tumor biology because if the, as you're on chemo and the tumor progresses, then that's an, that's an aggressive tumor and probably a surgical resection would not be possible. But if it regresses, or, um, then that's, that's a favorable thing. If while he's on chemo, the patient will develop maybe an extra hepatic metastasis, then you know that it's, it's, not a, it's not an indication. But you can downsize those people into an R0 resection, um, um, as I'm going to show in a couple of trials now. Um, the response to chemo is the most important prognostic factor in this case. Um, if the patient have an unresectable meds, then you would do a new, new chemo adjuvant, a new adjuvant chemo and reassess, mainly full FOX. Uh, there's a trial by Adam et al. showed that 12% of those will become resectable, if, which is basically uh, 5 fluorouracil leucovorin, and oxaliplatin. If you add um, the IRI, which is ironectin, then sometimes it go up to 19% uh, achievable R0 resection. And the survival is, goes up to 30 months after you downsize those people to an R0 resection versus 14 months if they are not a surgical candidates. There's uh, also some paper describing a staged hepatic resection. You do a resection, you do a chemotherapy, and you do a second resection. And this is a very rare situation. Sometimes the candidates would, for the, it, it happens usually with a portal vein embolization scenario. An example for that would be a patient who has a huge burden on the right side, but have a small isolated meds also on the left. So um, you, you want to go ahead and do portal embolization for the left to increase it, but you have a small, we have a cancer there. You cannot do that. You go and resect the, primary, the, the first one, uh, do uh, portal vein embolization, increase the size after the resection, and then go ahead and take care of the other side um, after um, a few months. And that has been shown that it increased survival too. Uh, if a patient has a liver mets, and then after you take care of it surgically, and then it, another METs happen after a few years or a few months, then this, it's a similar the indication of therapy is the same. You have to go back and reassess the patient and, and uh, see if he's a good candidate, what's the uh, reserve that he has, and, and start it all over again. Um, most extrahepatic METs are a contraindication for a liver resection. Uh, with 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 a, a small uh, um, exceptions, sometimes you have a hepatic lymphadenectomy. Then you can take those lymph nodes out while you're doing the liver resection, or a small nodule in the in the lung. Then you can do a low wedge resection or something. You can take care of it. But other, if if it's a huge burden outside the liver, then I'll, that would be a contraindication for a liver resection. And a few last words about portal vein embolization. This was described in the early 90s, um, uh, mostly done through a percutaneous route. Uh, you will achieve an ipsilateral uh, atrophy with a contralateral hypertrophy. And it's really up to 10-15% the increase in the size uh, in, the, in the contralateral side. You would repeat the imaging after three to four weeks. And, uh, um, and if, if it's, if it's uh, responding, then you would intervene at that period of time. If, the, if it fails to respond, then that's a poor indicator of a poor outcome, and that would be a contraindication to surgery. Um, it's a, it's, it's a, a procedure that can be done with low rates of complications. Majority will achieve 
um, hypertrophy that we need for surgical resection. So in summary about um, talking about liver tumors, treatment of hepatic neoplasms requires a comprehensive understanding of the disease presentation pathology and treatment options. There should be careful assessment about the hepatic reserve, the anatomical location, and the oncological context to determine what is the most effective therapy. There's advances in surgical technique, preoperative management, and adjunctive therapy uh, has extended the indication of the hepatic resections. The surgical therapy, which is resection and transplantation, remains the primary and most effective treatment for hepatic neoplasms. And there's ongoing work needed to develop adjuvant therapies to aid operative treatment and improve outcomes. And with this, I'll end my call and happy to take my, my uh, talk and happy to take questions. Thank you. Yeah, so, um, good, good overview. One question I've had for a, a long time, and based on your presentation, I doubt it's been answered definitively, is the question about doing the uh, colon resection and the resection for the liver metastasis uh, simultaneously. Because on, on the one hand, that seems desirable, mm. because if you can walk out of that operating room with the patient at least grossly disease-free, rather than do the colectomy first and let their liver met grow and maybe further metastasize for six weeks or so and then come back and get it at another time. Uh, on the other hand, it does seem like a way to biologically select the tumors that are more favorable mm -hmm. uh, if you just do the colon first. And if it's six weeks, it's widespread and it's all over the lymph nodes or other parts of the liver or, you know, you got something in the lung then that patient wasn't going to do well anyway. Um, and you can then select for delayed resection those with more favorable, bi favorable biology. But are you doing a disservice to some patients? Are there any studies out there that compare the two approaches? The, uh, the only thing that I've seen over there was if it really does not answer the question definitely. definitely. It's just basically a clinical judgment at that time. If the patient has... Um, um, a sing if he has an underlying liver function that will survive a resection, and the, the, the METS is confined to a place that can be anatomically resected, then that's your approach, that's what you need to do. Now, if, you know, there's, in terms of selecting the people, the, doing the liver, the colon first to select the biology of the tumor, I did not see that. I don't know if Dr. Health can answer that question. I did not see a paper for that. I think what's most important is most of the time you should treat these patients with chemotherapy before you do the liver resection um, because that does exactly what you suggested. It selects out the patients that are probably going to be helped by the resection. Um, if more lesions show up while they're being treated with chemotherapy, then you have a better sense of what you need to do in terms of treating the tumor. Most of the patients where we've done simultaneous resections have actually had chemotherapy before either the colon or the liver were resected um, because the oncologists see a lot of these patients before the surgeons do. And if that's the situation, then there's been a period of time to have a sense of what the tumor is going to do. And at that point, if technically you can do both, uh, it sometimes makes sense to. Okay, so on your oral boards, mm -hmm. uh, you know, one, one safe approach has been don't do more than a left lateral segmentectomy at the time of your colectomy, okay? And if you get in there and you find, and, you know, intraoperative findings and assessment become very important in that as well. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think what Dr. Howe suggested, if the patient's had pre-op chemo and you know you've got favorable biology and favorable anatomy such that a, a lobe would be a reasonable thing to do, that's a good, safe answer. Um, just recognize the potential when you take your oral boards. You know, a lot of times there's no right or wrong answer on a given question. Mm -hmm. Whatever you choose, then the downside of that approach is going to show up on, show up on <laughs> yeah. the, next, the next verbal interaction. And so if you choose not to resect, okay, um, then the patient's going to come back needing resection. You're going to have to do it at a second time. And then you're going to get in, and then you're going to find nets that have, you know, since grown up or something. If you choose to resect, uh, you're going to have some hemorrhagic, hemorrhagic complication or something from your liver resection during the case that you're going to have to deal with yeah. to get the patient through that hospital stay. It doesn't mean you chose the wrong answer. It just means whichever option you choose, 
you're going to have to you're going to have to deal with the consequences of your choices. Yes, sir. That's right. Uh, so let's say you, uh, you 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 took a colon resection and you have a lesion in segment seven or six or seven, a big lesion. You thought it's too big whack to do it at the same time, and the patient is on chemo, but, but and this lesion disappeared, gone. What would you do? Um, the, um, the response to chemotherapy, um, um, if you want to get the best outcome from that, you would go and resect that part because um, the, the part that, was, that had the tumor in, because sometimes a lot of, that will reduce the recurrence, if that's your, if that's your, that's answers your question. Yeah. You have to go. If you go back and look at it after, after chemo, you image the liver, there's nothing there. Mm -hmm. So would you go back, would you resect that? The lesion, that segment seven or six, whatever the lesion was in. Now, you know, the, the, what I looked at is response to chemo not disappearing, regressing, and when you resect, you would take part of the tissue that had the original tumor. For disappearing tumor, I don't know what's the answer to that, sir. Dr. Hell. In, 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 in that situation, 70% of the time, they're still viable tumor cells. Yeah. The challenge is being able to figure out exactly where to resect it, since sometimes you can no longer see or feel a lesion. Yeah. You're right. You have to have a compulsive pathologist. Go sack, 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 and he'll, he'll find the tumor. So the answer, you remove it. You don't leave it. Yes. Biologically, it may, may be, you know, it's different than clinically. Clinically, you see something, but really, biologically, the tumor is still there, still viable. Mm -hmm. This is the answer, like you said. Yes, sir. We've seen the uh, primary colorectal tumor behave differently than the METs. Uh, sometimes the patients getting neoadjuvant chemotherapy, they'll clear the METs in the liver, allegedly, and in the meantime, the one in the colon is growing and almost becoming unresectable at that time. Uh, Dr. Uh, Mary Pat uh, Moyer, who is on the faculty here, uh, was growing cells in vivo, and when we were testing them, the ones, the primary, behave differently than the METs in the liver. And so I, I guess there's a different biology once it gets out of the primary. Dr. Loeb. Thank you for that. That was a really good, I thought, summation of that in review, especially for people that will be taking the boards in the next year. Um, it's interesting, you know, I think when people, there's some people out there that have enthusiasm for the liver first method where you get, present with metastatic disease and they get chemo, then resect the liver, then subsequently colon after that with the thought that you don't let the liver potentially get out of the bag by doing the colon first. And one thing to bear in mind if you choose to go that route is I've seen it where they actually do get such a good response both to the met metastatic disease but also to the primary that you can't find the primary that easily. So if you're going to do that, I think that too is important. You mean if, if, the, if, I, if, I don't, if I don't know where the GI tumor is? Is that the question, ma'am? If you go in knowing where the GI tumor is and plan from the get-go that you're going to treat with chemo, then do liver first and subsequently colon, I think it's important to catch you the colon because I've seen the colon respond so well. Even oh, though okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Pretty yeah. sizable. Yeah. Yeah. Then is, you go back and try to find the colon so everyone's like... That is true. If, if, the, if, the, if the primary that you, in, in the colon was... Um, locally aggressive, but not not a not a big one that's going to be like an obstructive or hemorrhagic. Then yes, they they might disappear to the degree that you cannot feel them anymore. There's a paper about that and tattooing and preoperative pre chemo tattooing would be would be the route to go. Yes, ma'am. We saw one recently. It was so difficult yeah. that it took probably six passes even to find the remnants. So. Yeah. Great. Dr. Halp, is there any good test for hepatic function these days? I know he listed four or five different ways of doing it. Uh, or is it just eyeballing the patient? Because in our past experience, prior to CT scans, people we would operate on people with colorectal cancer, they would have absolutely normal liver function tests, and we got in there, it looked like 80% of the liver had already been re replaced uh, with metastatic disease. We don't use the endocyanine green or anything like that. We look at basic um, things like um, the INR, the albumin, um, just basic liver functions. We look at the patient, if they had complications like ascites, encephalopathy. Um, sometimes we look at the liver volume. If they have a very small liver volume, that suggests they don't have much. Disease. Usually end stage. Right. Uh, any yeah. other questions? Well, one other thing I would mention, is there more and more options to treat liver tumors non-surgically? The yeah. microwave ablation can do a larger ablation than RFA now, and it's becoming uh, the more common choice.
the nano knife uh, doesn't use heat to ablate, so you can um, destroy small tumors that are near bile ducts or near blood vessels. And I think it's important to be aware of these if you're counseling a patient on the different treatment options for liver tumor. Yes, sir. Yeah. And especially for our face close to blood vessels, they don't work well. Because yeah. of the heat yeah. sink. Yeah. But the nano knife can work yeah. there. Yeah. So have you heard about acetic acid uh, uh, injection, like alcohol, but it's cheaper? Yes, sir, but uh, it's... it's in, my, my in, 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 as a palliative thing, somebody with, you know, non-operable, uh, bad disease, palliative, symptomatic, yes. you can particularly... Yeah. In there, there's a lot, that's part of the local regionals, but the ones that I focused on are the other phase and taste just for the sake of time. But yes, alcohol has been described, but I think that was before these developments, and I think it's, it's not, you know, with, with, the, with the microwave knife, now it's, this is falling out of favor, but it, it, for symptomatic treatment only, but not for survival or achieving cure. Just to clear it, that's alcohol injected, not taken. You know. <laughs> All righty, thank you very much. on now. I'll send you that thing later. I can't log into my... I'm going to send you this ridiculous Excel and you can just kind of like decide okay. whether it makes sense to you. You may need explanation. Okay. <laughs> it's a lot of colored boxes. So many of How was your call? Oh, it's a disaster. It sucks you have to do this. Sorry. Oh, my hair is amazing. <laughs> She's postponed. <laughs> I know. I just love giving her grief. Yeah. You ready? Uh, sure. All right, let's get going with Morbidity Mortality Conference. Our first case is from uh, the Surgical Oncology Service.